good afternoon and good day to everybody again for joining us for our second um, week in the series of webinars that is provided by the Caribbean Youth Film Festival. Um, let me thank my guest today, Bob Hopkins, um, a producer, director, actor um, out of California. Here with us today, we're going to discuss um, basically on, on acting and directing and just the Hollywood process. You give us a little idea of what it means to be in Hollywood, you know. Um, so let me just thank my, our sponsors, uh, uh, um, the OECS, the, the Ministry of, of Creative Industries, um, Events and Lucia, and um, also we'd like to thank the National Trust for hosting our, our work, workshops that we've been having. We have a great group of, of young participants who've been going through the motions for the past two weeks. And they have been learning um, a number of, of skills in terms of directing, cinematography, makeup, um, journalism. So we have them, we have them pretty much on the go and learning and trying to get as much knowledge of the industry as possible. So that knowledge extends right here today as part of our webinars with, as I said, um, Bob Hopkins, who is um, my co-producer. I could I could um, safely say now that we're co-producing a film and we hope to get that out soon um, but let me allow Bob to introduce himself further and we could we'll have a further chit chat with him yeah Colin thank you um, yeah I'm, I'm uh, the film industry is is a very interesting and challenging business it's actually an industry they call it the industry because there's so many facets of it and you know, pretty much everybody seems to come to Hollywood to become an actor first, and then they they don't make it as an actor. They seem to become agents or makeup people, directors, producers, writers. So uh, everybody, the people generally have somewhat of a knowledge of what other people are doing and, and how the whole system works. Um, I started out as an actor and worked on a lot of television shows and movies, and then Oddly enough, I decided to have a family and there was a little more security in getting involved as a producer and a writer and more satisfaction because there's not too many actors that love each part that they get. You don't really have control over much. You just take the part uh, that you get. Whereas a producer, director, writer, um, you know, has more of a say in the creative process. So I segued over to, uh, I started out by writing screenplays. And then, uh, like most writers, they have a director uh, take their screenplay and make a different kind of movie out of it than they thought they had written. And so they become writer-directors. And then generally, the third step is you're a writer-director, but you can't, nobody will make your movie. So you become a producer. And the producer is the one who puts the whole movie together that's that's the person who gets the academy award for the best picture everybody else gets best director best this best that they don't get best movie or best producer they they're the ones who produce the movie so that's kind of the scale that i took i i went from one to the other to fill my needs my creative needs as much as anything to to see my projects get made so that's pretty much the evolution. I've done, uh, I've directed many television shows and produced TV show, um, and films as well, and still, you know, acting as well in, in, in all of them. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it just depends on, on what your talents are, I guess. Some people don't want any part of being in front of the camera. They just want to be behind the scenes. Other people just want to write. They just like to stay in their homes and just write these stories, and then they get into their agent, and then the agent go out and goes out and pushes it, and then um, the movie gets made or doesn't get made. There's, there's so much to each one of these that that's the overall picture. For example, a writer, they generally never buy a script. What they do is they, they'll option it for six months or a year. So if they want to pay you $100,000 for the movie, they'll usually give you like $10,000 to option it for six months. And then if they don't make the movie or get the movie going in six months, you get all the rights again. I wrote one script uh, that was optioned eight different times and it still has never been made. So uh, you never know how, how it's going to turn out as far as your projects, unless you're the producer. 
And then you know if it's going to be made or not. And that's where Colin and I are at this moment. We're getting the momentum going. We're getting people interested. We're doing it pretty much by the book as far as I've done for the past 35, 40 years. So that's kind of an overall. If there's any specific questions, then we can get into more detail. Yeah, okay. Well, I did want to get a little more into your, your own history in, in Hollywood, um, how you got started, what, what gave you that, 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 that drive, what, why you decided to come into Hollywood, and, and what, how did you find yourself and, and, and getting those roles? What was the process like to get it? We know that you were on, on shows like Fantasy Island and Knight Rider and Simon and & Simon and Airwolf. I mean, all the all the goodies of the 80s. I mean, that's shows that I grew up on, and I and I ran to the TV every week to watch. And, and knowing that I could, <laughs> that I'm actually working with you today, it's, it's quite exciting. Um, so tell us a little about about that process. Um, how did you get, you know? So well, involved? I don't think there's anybody that's in Hollywood unless you come from the royalty, meaning your your father or mother was a big star, and you know you're a kid like the Fondas or whatever. I, everybody has a different story. I actually graduated college with a math degree and I was, you know, slated to be an accountant or a engineer or something on that line, but I just didn't like really being inside. And, and I had a couple of jobs out of college and I was up in San Francisco on the 14th floor of my office building. And I looked out and saw a freighter a ship, you know, sailing under the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, and I said, you know, I'd rather be swabbing the deck on that ship than sitting in this office. So I kind of, I took different jobs almost just to get out of the office, and I, I quit the accounting, and I more or less found out what I didn't want to do in life, because um, I took so many different jobs, and then out of nowhere, a girl in my apartment building was um, was going on a commercial. Just a, it was a cigarette commercial, and it was just when America had banned print advertising for cigarettes, so they couldn't appear in, or, or they, they banned uh, cigarettes on TV. But they started doing a lot of print ads in, in magazines. And so she said to me, it's, this particular uh, shoot was for a German company, and it was for Camel Cigarettes, and they were looking for, you know, a blonde, blue-eyed, German-looking guy. She was, she looked like that. And she said, you ought to come down. And I said, I don't want to be a model, a model. You know, it just seems so narcissistic. And she says, oh, you don't want to, you know, travel around the world. And I said, well, that sounds really good. And she goes, you want to make some pretty good money? And I said, sure. And she said, you know, there's a lot of pretty girls in this business. And I said, what time is the audition? <laughs> and the rest is pretty much history. I ended up getting the job. It was no speaking to it. But I was around for a couple of days and it just felt good. The people were, were creative people. Um, you know, it wasn't that office cooler situation where people were, you know, gossiping behind your back and all that stuff. They just seemed like it was a group of people, a creative force that was working all together to, to make, you know, a little photograph look perfect. So from there, I decided I really liked it and I wanted to explore more. So I did the first thing any one who try, wants to get into acting should do, I found an acting school and realized I was a, not a natural. I was nervous. I said, I don't know if I can do this. And then, you know, little by little, if you're really, a lot of people drop right out, but I kind of was determined to see it through. And then from there, it kind of grew. And I got a commercial, um, a basket, playing a basketball player, and then the next commercial, I had a couple of lines and then I got an agent and then I started going out on the other casting calls. But I always, you know, went to school because you can't get up in front of a camera or a stage enough. And plus, it's such a networking community that anything that you do with other people in the business, like one of the guys that was in my class, about five years later, he had dropped out of acting and he became a director. So he hired me for one of his shows. And so that that's the kind of way it works. So I just kind of really, you know, I'm not one of these guys like you, Colin, who at what, 14, you knew you wanted to be a, a director, producer, cameraman and all that stuff. I can't say that that that's how I started out. I, I kind of, like I said, I fell, I really kind of fell into it. And just, and from that moment on, 
you know, my family would say, what are you doing? Why don't you become an accountant where you have a stable life? And I said, you know, I, I just love it too much. I don't even care if I make money. I just love doing it. And that's another thing about actors. Some people save, they're going to save money. And, and then that way they can come to town and, and tough it out. But you know, that, that's not really the, the way to do it because working also introduces you to people. Um, you know, get a job at a gym because actors and producers, they work out. Get a job at the nicest restaurant in town because they all go out to eat. You know, get a job in those kind of situations where you put yourself, uh, give yourself an opportunity to network. And so that's what I did. And, um, and the funny thing about Hollywood, they call it being in the loop. And because every day casting directors for, for the, I did Airwolf and other shows, they would get, because they were weekly shows, they eight days to shoot one. So they're literally doing a new show every week and a half. And casting directors, they get, I'm not kidding you, they probably get 500, uh, in those days, envelopes with a photograph and a resume stacked up to your knee, you know. And they're like a lot of people, they're lazy. And so if you've worked for them before and they see the part when it comes in, they say, okay, and they'll bring in like five or six different guys or, you know, for the part. And I would go after a while and see really the same, my same friends. And, uh, you know, I'd get one of the shows and then I'd go over to Knight Rider and, you know, or something else I didn't get. And I'd see kind of the same people. So I was really in the loop. And when you're in the loop, that's when you start working. You do. You really do. Because you get to know the casting directors at Universal Studios. There's like seven casting directors that were probably doing, you know, at least 10 or 15 shows. And so, you know, they're casting for more than one show. So if I did an Airwolf, the next couple of weeks later, they might want me to do a Night Rider. So that's really, you know, kind of how it works. You still have to audition. You still have to read for the producers and the directors and the writers. So it's not like they give you the part. But you get the audition and that's the secret so that's how i got into it and from there it just proceeded and that's why you know you make friends the first thing you do like at the studios they all have a gate when you come in there's a gate and you have to you know go, go, go past the guard and so when i would work on a show in the beginning when i first started out i would go back to whatever studio it was all the time just to make sure i could go by and wave to the guy and go hey joe how's it going even if i wasn't working they didn't they, they recognize you and see you. But then I would be able to, you know, walk around the studios and and, um, and network with the people working there. I'm talking about the grips, everybody, anybody I could. And to this day, that's why I have maintained uh, a lot of contacts at all the studios. And um, so it's a continue. I guess you could say, you know, all these years later, I'm still kind of doing what I did back when I started. Good. We have we have a question here um, from from somebody. I, I I hope you could see it. Can you see it? What what kind of Caribbean young uh, young people do to get into acting? Because your experience will not be close to theirs. In other words, um, since we you know we're basically um, not as active in, of an industry as you are, so the the jobs are fine and few in between. Um, please give suggestions to them in breaking in. Okay, well, you're right. It's a totally different uh, situation, scenario. Um, but it's the same philosophy. If you want to be an actor, act. Get in front of people. Any kind of theater group, any kind of opportunity to perform. And if you are in front of people, people will see you and recognize you. And if your work is interesting and good, it doesn't have to be in the beginning, so don't get discouraged, but it's all about being seen. You cannot pretend to be a singer and, and lip sync in your bedroom to the latest hit and think that you're going to be a star because no one's seeing you. So you have to be seen. So whether it's student films, I would say is probably the biggest and the first avenue to getting in movies and television because, you know, those are something you can make or with your friends or whatever. And then you will have what they call as a reel have a demo reel so if you put together three or four little short pieces you don't even have to have a student film just get a camera and have your brother or sister and do some kind of little monologue or some kind of they, you know my entire acting reel is only like two minutes so 
that you just need like you know 30 seconds of of a different character you wear your hair different you wear uh glasses you wear different clothing um maybe you wear different makeup you look you know like a dirty scoundrel and then you have a tuxedo and another shot but then whomever in your area and see what you're like on screen because there really is something about is someone photogenic you know because people can look different on screen than they do in person i used to see it all the time some of these people that were these big stars they weren't as attractive as they looked like on film and other people uh, were much different looking than they were on on, on film so if the idea is to get it I would say get a demo together. And in the case of the Caribbean, which is what we are trying to do in St. Lucia, Colin and I are getting other people to come there and make movies because a producer like myself, we're going to hire local people. And I don't really know any of the people talent in St. Lucia, but Colin does. And we'll hold auditions. We're going to let people know. And we will have to get at least a headshot. You have to get some kind of a, a photograph of yourself. And then a resume, if you haven't done much, that's fine. Just say that, but you're interested and maybe you've done this and that. And then we bring you in for what they call a cold reading. And then from there, you either get the part or you don't. But I think that's the, the best thing is to do is to try to do some short films, a theater, if there's anything like that, whether you're in school. I know a lot of schools in America have theater classes where they, you know, at the end of each semester, they put on a little play or whatever. And then if we can get people to come to your island, then you'll have an opportunity to be in film. And that's what happens. That's why people go to Hollywood because they're making a lot of movies. there. They don't go to Buffalo, New York, because they're not making any movies. There. So that, that would be my suggestion. There are ways, and especially now with the internet, you can put your reel on the internet and show people. Yeah, and then the same thing, and that's how you can get an agent. See, once you get an, enough footage of yourself to uh, on a reel, then you can get an agent because an agent, you know, that's, that's how you get the work because people go to agents uh, to, to find the talent. And so that's, that's the next step on, on that scale as far as, you know, photograph, video, agent, and then on your own, just see what's, what's happening out there. I mean, I, I could see with the internet, if there was a movie being shot, if you do the research and it's, you know, there's no, exact book on that but if you did the research on maybe they're shooting a movie over in Barbados or St. Vincent they shot a lot of Caribbean um, parts of the Caribbean I know on St. Vincent so maybe these days you can find out who's in charge and you could you know you could uh, uh, somehow email your your demo reel to the casting director so you know there's a little bit of detective work to it there's a lot of everything to it is what it comes down to it depends on how much you want to hustle what what is what is expected from an actor um, going on an audition? What 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 would the natural um, what would the process be like? What what is required of them? To do so? That I think is the most important part of an actor's um, portfolio. I mean, you can be the prettiest girl in the world, or the coolest guy in the world, or the fattest guy in the world, and 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 it all comes down to when you go in. And you'll usually meet with the, a casting director, the producer, the director, maybe the writer. Not usually, they don't like to have them in the office too much. But um, and they'll give you what they call sides, and the sides are usually like two or three pages of the script where your scene is. Okay, say you're playing a, a host on a cruise ship, and the scene is you're greeting people coming on board, and you have maybe. You know, anywhere from one line to, you know, 20 lines. So you'll read it with a casting director. You'll be in a room that's just a regular office type of room or whatever the setting is. And if the scene takes, takes place like on a boat or in a jungle or whatever, you still, so you don't try to recreate all that. But the good actors, um, like I was trained as a method actor. Okay, so the scene is, Maybe the scene they give you is this guy's been running from the police and he ha and the scene you have is he has the dialogue now. So you don't just read the dialogue like, boy, that was a close call. That guy almost caught me. It's like first thing, ah, your reaction is, wow, that guy almost caught me. I should have never done that. Oh, man. 
You know what I mean? So you inject other things that you can't change the scenery. You inject emotions and, and all of those because, for example, if you're if you're moving around like that, you naturally your voice changes because that's what you do. So you try to incorporate these things into your reading because it's natural. It's not just, you're literally, it's miscon the misconception is it's called a cold reading, but you don't want to make it sound like you're reading. Okay? So that's the, that's the key is to be prepared to come in there and bring something else into the scene. I did an audition one time for Airwolf, actually. And this guy was supposed to be a cocky tennis player and all that. So I came in with my shorts on and, you know, trying to look as cool as I can. And, and I had some sunglasses and I put the sunglasses like this here, you know, up in my hair like this, you know, came in, started talking this and that. And then my glasses started falling down and then they got caught in my hair. And I was taught just keep saying the dialogue. So I kept saying, yeah, well, the guy's a pretty good guy, but I don't know what, if he's going to be back by later tonight. So I just kept with it. And they started cracking up the people in the, uh, that were interviewing me. They started cracking up, and it wasn't a funny scene. So I went with it, and I got out, and by the time, you know, in those days I got to a pay phone to call my agent. She said, you got the part. And it was like, I, it was either, I was like, I was, it was so bad, I, was, I just really messed up. My glasses got caught, but it became real. And see, if I had just said, pretended like this didn't happen, and just kept reading my dialogue like I'm supposed to be, then that wouldn't have worked. So after that, I, I learned so much from that because I kind of would inject these things into my reading to make them seem more real. Like I could be in the middle of a scene and talking something, and if I couldn't really get an adjustment on it, I would literally get up and, and stand my dialogue as if I lost something. And people would look on the floor, what's he looking for? And I'm still saying the dialogue. And they're going, wow, that was a different reading. And so, you know, that's... But that comes with confidence too. You, don't, you have confidence. You, you're not worried about getting the job. Um, that's why when I said my family, when, when I got into producing stuff, it, the interviews became different because I needed this job. Um, and that's a bad frame of mind for an actor because you put too much pressure on yourself and you can't be natural. So, yeah. so as we get into that aspect, what is the relationship between the, the actor and the director most times when you, when you get um, into any any production, any set. What well, again, think? that's that, that. There's really there's really two types of directors, and one are an actor's director where they'll actually go through it with you, ask you if you have any questions. You are the main part of the scene. Other directors, they don't say a word to you. They're too interested in the camera angle, the camera movement, the lighting special effect that's going to be going off and back of you. So you have to be prepared to do, in other words, I have a lot of actors that say, well, I'm not sure how to do this scene. I'm just going to wait for the director to tell me what to do. Well, a lot of times that doesn't happen. Um, but you have to be prepared to do the scene without any direction. And I can't think of many times where my interpretation has been different from the director where the director said, cut, cut, no, this isn't going to work. You're not angry enough. Or you might have something like that. Be a little bit more angry about this. But it, 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 I don't ever remember it being like so far off um, the wall that that you didn't, you know. And I've seen some people, and they, as a director, now that's as an actor. As a director, I look at directing as a, being a babysitter, almost. I mean, the cameraman and the director know the shot. They're going to set it up. The cameraman's going to do his move. But the director has to... I always felt like I had to deal with the actors. And some of them need to be told they're doing wonderful work. This is the best actress I've ever seen. And then others need to be challenged and say, come on, you know, you're kind of walking through this. Let's you know, get into it. Take five minutes. We'll take a break. And I want you to come back and charge into this part. So, yeah, so get to know your director because then you can... You know, you'll know what to be expected when you are on the set. And th this shouldn't happen when you get to the set. You should, you know, if the director is, doesn't, is not forthcoming to you, you should have a conversation and say, well, what do you think? Here's the way I see it to be played. What do you think? And some will say, yeah, but maybe not so much, so much edginess. Maybe a little bit more, you know, reserved, you know? Um, so, yeah, it, it, I mean, 
that's why you have to be prepared because you don't know what you're going to get in the director. You don't know what you're going to get from your other actors or actors. I mean, you don't know, like some people, you know, if you want to shoot their angle and then the reverse angle, some of them, when, when you work with some stars, they don't want to be off screen, you know, throwing you lines. They are too busy in their trailer and stuff. So they bring in somebody else to throw your lines. Um, and of course the editor cuts all that out and, um, you have to deal with it that way. So that's that's that makes it a little tougher. It's nice to have the one on one so you can really feel the chemistry if there is any. And that's the only way you're gonna get chemistry. If you're looking at someone and you look at their eyes and they're going you get a little something going on, you go, Yeah. You feel the, the energy. And a lot of ones you don't, but you still have to, you know, come across as as knowledgeable and, and you know, in character. So yeah, one one of the things I, I did explain to to my group um, during the workshop um, when we were shooting that each, each scene would require setup, and there are a number of setups in terms of you know your close ups, your your long shots, and so forth for each scene. So as an actor, you kind of have to give the energy and, and and be consistent and the continuity on each scene. So you know that that whatever whatever it is, whatever is required, it can't be just be once. You know so. So it has to be right. you have to be able to do this multiple times. Yeah, like on the on the unestablishing shot, you know, you might be a little bit more animated if it's if it's if you know it's a long shot uh, as opposed to the close ups. And of course the close ups you have to be really subtle because the camera picks up everything. Right. right. You overdo anything. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, just you just need a little look, a little squint of the eyes, you know. What'd you say? You don't need to go, what did you say? And so, yeah, so there's a lot of that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, and then the idea, too, which a lot of actors, some directors, they don't say it as much. They don't, they're not as conscious of it, but trying to match what you did in the master shot. You know what I mean? Like on the word, Joe came in, Joe came in. And then on the close up, try to remember that you said right. Joe came in, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so that's always tricky and, and and also as a director that's why i don't like them to do too much business because then they have to remember it and the script girl saying no no you took your classes off before this and that mm -hmm. there's a lot of matching problems right yeah, so i don't like people smoking a cigarette in the old days when everybody smoked that was the worst because you're halfway through the cigarette and then it's like okay now the close-up where was the cigarette you know <laughs> It's terrible stuff. And you can see it all the time in the old movies. They don't, nothing matches. You know, it's like, Definitely. yeah. yeah we, have, we have another question here. Explain the different types of acting. Um, you spoke brief, briefly that you were thought as a method actor. So they just wanted to try out the different types. Well, yeah, some people, I guess I don't, I was taught the method acting. So that's what I know. But I know other people because method acting is, it comes from inside you. Okay. So that's, that to me means that like we used to do things, say it's a sad, it's a sad scene. And I'm looking at my, my, my partner in the scene and maybe I envision, you know, losing anything from a pet to a best friend. And I kind of think about that. And, you know, you don't have to remember the scene really bad, but if someone's, someone you really loved is is God. It doesn't matter who you're talking about. You come across as, as an emotional person about that. So I would personalize it. So I would personalize someone who would, who had, in this case, passed away or was injured and I could relate to it. And right away I'm seeing this person. So I'm just, I'm just talking, visualizing this person. I'm not doing anything other stuff. That's method acting. Other actors say, no, no, you don't need to waste your time with that. Just just get the emotion, rehearse the emotion. So when you get on the set, you're not encumbered with having to conjure up something. You've already done your homework and you know this is the way I'm going. So you're working externally, you're pounding your fist because that looks like I'm mad. I've seen it on every movie. Well, that's the biggest cliche in the world. You know, how about the bad guys? How many times did you see a bad guy smile before he's going to shoot someone? You know, it's like, you're not angry. I'm going to kill you. You better give me that money. But they go, just, you better give me that money. You're going down so fast. So, you know, you don't want to be 
cliche because then you're like everybody else. You want to be different. Like Marlon Brando, remember when he first came in, you couldn't understand a word he said. He would grunt and groan and everybody thought it was the greatest thing ever because he was being so real. So, yeah, I, I just think uh, it depends. And I'm not saying one's better than the other, really, because I've seen some really uh, great actors that don't subscribe to the method stuff. And I've seen some really bad actors that do subscribe to the method because they get so involved, they get so emotional and they can't, they're not ready to do the scene because they haven't reached their full amount of emotional impact. And so you have to wait and it's like, now I feel it. Okay, quick, shoot. That doesn't work either. That's, you know, producers and directors don't, don't like that attitude. So you gotta, you gotta find your own way. And that's, that's what I did. I went to some acting schools. The first one I went to, you know, the acting, my acting teacher just, you know, we used to do monologues all the time and she would just take apart each sentence and go, no, you need to raise your voice here. You need to, you know, oh, it, but it just didn't seem very natural to me. And I couldn't keep up with all that, what I'm supposed to do. And then the, the method acting gave me a tool. Like, for example, when you're doing a phone call, when you do a phone call in a movie, the, the, the person's not on the other end of the phone that you're talking to. I mean, it's a, it's a fake phone call. So you try to, okay, so if, if, it's a, if it's a little kid, you talk differently. So you try to, you know, hear someone you know, your little sister or brother. It's like, you know, you talk to them differently. Like, hey, how you doing? Yeah, that's good. That's so good to hear. You just talk to people differently like that. So you have, so the idea, I really enjoyed that one because when I had a phone call with, in a scene, like if it was a, a police guy calling me and he wants to know if I just, you know, had an altercation, it would be like, uh, uh, oh gosh, no, sir. No, no, I'd never do that. You know, it's just a, if you hear another voice, then I think it helps you because you're not concentrating on your line and trying to say your line with an inflection and, in, you know, you rehearsed it so many times that you want to make sure you get that beat. There he goes. But if, he, if it comes from within, you could say it five or six different ways and it would all sound real. And if it sounds real, it works. So, uh, yeah, that's about all I can really say about the acting approach to it. Some people are really natural. I mean, I've seen some people that they, don't, they say, I don't know, I don't, I don't do anything. I just get up there and say the line and they're really good. So, but I'm not one of them. No. Okay, I, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, we are on our second on our second in the Karen Newton series of webinars of what we can speak about Hopkins, who is an actor, producer, director of Hollywood. Um, what I want to do, um, ask Bob right now is, is, is that transition from from acting to to um, to producing, directing, and now you find yourself on the other side of the you know, of, of the industry, more or less, to speak. Where, where you kind of you know making your own decisions and stuff like that how did you find that transition for you because now you're not necessarily waiting on for the gig but now you have to present the gig so so how how was that for you now presenting a firm and presenting a project and, and it's not something that that's already um ready made that you're walking into but now you actually trying to create that how is that um, for you putting putting that to you know studios and and getting through on that angle? Well, that's that's a great question because it's it's such a process. At least it was for me. Um, I didn't know I didn't know what a producer was when I first came to Hollywood. A and a lot of people didn't. You know, producer, director, what do they do? A writer, you know, and an actor, but you don't know what really what other people do necessarily. And so I again, you know, kind of learned it as I went and. Uh, I think this is what the, what discourages a lot of people from doing, becoming a producer, because really a producer and a director are different, totally different. The producer is like the, you know, the, the, uh, the business part of it. And I always tell people as a producer, I mean, 80% of producing is, is putting everything together, getting the money and then, you know, shooting the film and editing the film is, well, of course, that's the best part of it. And I only do this to get to that point. Um, but it's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of people when you're when you're searching out money. Uh, do you go to the studio? Do you want to be an independent producer? Um, it depends on the project. People, some people like to do horror movies, thriller movies. Other people like to do family movies. So you have to first of all have a script. You have to know your script and who you want to pitch it to. Who do you want to who do you want to uh, talk to about financing? 
And the same thing with any of your cast or your or your production people, your crew. Um, you know, if you're dealing with experienced people, they have a choice usually of what projects they want to work on. I remember I was uh, pitching a uh, a thriller that a lot of it was going to be shot in a freight train yard. You know, a dirty, dusty freight trains. You know, and. I was trying to get Sharon Stone, if everybody remembers her from Basic Instinct, yeah. beautiful lady, <clears throat> and I was trying to get her involved. So I spoke with her agent, and he said very simply, well, let's see. She hasn't offered to do a movie on the Italian Riviera this summer, or she could do your movie in the Detroit train yard. <laughs> he said, what do you think she's going to want to do? And I said, well, can we shoot this movie on the Riviera? And uh, anyways, it was like, uh, obviously, that's as far as that went. So, you know, again, I, I figured it would be a hard sell, but uh, I figured I'd give it a shot. But it wasn't realistic. So go with somebody who might be more willing to do that kind of a, a picture. So I think you just really have to understand what your project is and, and understand who might be interested in doing it. And it, that's why I kind of got away from the studio system a little bit, not, you know, distribution and some of those things, of course, you need them for, but as far as raising money uh, independently, because then I could, uh, I could do what I wanted to do more or less. It's never what you want to do because you have an editor that says you should do this. Believe me, Bob, it's not going to work. And so you do it and they're usually right. And the same thing with your actors. They might say, no, I don't feel right doing it this way. I said, okay, you, you try to do it. But I'm a very open director. I, I like to hear people have um, their point of view on it because what do I have to lose? They come up with a great idea. If I don't like it, I just say, no, nah, let's stick with the script. So I try to, you know, try to work with what you have. And, and with the independent uh, angle, um, it just feels like there's more satisfaction to it, honestly. And they're usually lower budget which again is probably not as much stress with a bigger budget picture, but uh, yeah, the, and then you got to like my, as I mentioned previously that I had a mathematics background. So producing is about a lot of numbers, crunching a lot of numbers. So when you're pitching and you have a decent script and you have, everybody knows you're not going to really get anybody attached to these movies until you have the money in place, but you have names in mind so they can visualize it. And then you have the numbers because anybody that's going to be, you know, be involved in, on the financial end of it is going to want to see your numbers. And any investor has people, lawyers, accountants who want to see the numbers. Do they add up? How does this work? Is this realistic? Um, so those are all things that you have to have before you even begin to, to seek funding or or you want to pitch even if you're going to pitch it to the studio you still have to come in there with a with a budget that you think is realistic and of course they'll probably change it one way or the other or they'll want you to shoot it for less or they'll want to make it a big 10 pole pitcher and put like instead of two million in they'll put want to put you know 20 million 30 million in we all of those things change your picture too because more people become involved in the money so that's why i like the independent that's why i love what we are doing in saint lucia because um, you know, you know, the whole place, I know how to put it together and, you know, we all benefit from this and, and, uh, that's the kind of thing I like to do. Let me, let me just say, because I know that we mentioned it a couple of times, but we haven't really spoken in detail about it, but Bob and I, um, well, through Bob, we, we're currently trying to work on a, a, a film called Adventures in Paradise. Um, so it's a, it's a movie that we're trying to produce in St. Lucia. And um, we're hoping that we turn it into a, a, a series that will, you know, go on to a, a big, um, big distribution company and and and, and, and market Pentusia to the best that we could. So that that's the idea for it. Obviously, we won't get into detail on it, but um, when when we speak about the project that we're working on, that is the project. Um, there's a question here from uh, from Mark. And then let me say real quickly, anybody out there listening. This is a good opportunity for singers, dancers, any kind of talent, writers. And so look for it and keep keep in touch with Colin because, you know, we want to 
we'd love nothing more than to give you a start in this business. And this is going to be a great opportunity. So if you know people who really want to get in the business, you know, let them know because we will be very open um, to using specifically St. Lucians in this movie. So, okay, this question here. Yeah. What advice or how difficult is it to play a role within a role? For example, an actor playing the role of a police officer and halfway through in the movie playing the role of a doctor who is still playing the role of the police officer. How do you control the layers? So I'm not sure if that's, if, you, if it's an actor playing two parts in a movie, which happens a lot in low budget movies where, you know, they keep the, the back of the head and they put a different uniform on them. Or if it's a police officer who is, who is going undercover as a doctor. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking the latter, but I'm not too sure. Um, Mark, you want to, to further um, expound on, on what you trying because I'm I'm thinking that I was thinking exactly what you're thinking here. That if, if you do a movie like a, almost like um like John Travolta in what's the name Face Off, when when right. first he was you know one guy and then they they, they change characters and he had to become the other guy you know and, and vice versa. Right. Yeah. So Nicolas Cage had to yeah. But I would say either way, no matter what it is, if you're playing, you know, two characters like Mr. What's a uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. Yeah. They're two different characters, right? Uh, um, if you're a psycho, you you, you kind of you have to have that edge in it. Or or I don't, you know, it's that's a good question because yeah, well, he's, if you're he playing saying a something good doctor, else, or like face off, so he is saying here like going undercover. Yeah. Playing. So if you're, if you're playing a good doctor in the opening scenes, um. You, I would play it with, you know, straight as a good doctor, but put maybe a couple of little quirky things in here. Just do something quirky, even if you're glittering your eyes every so often going, hello? And then every so often you go like that or something, you know, but subtle. And so then when you become the other guy, it's not like so different. You cannot be totally squeaky clean. Although Psycho is really, I guess, you know, Ted Bundy was a big serial murderer in, in the States. And apparently he was the suavest thing, picking up these yeah. girls. He <laughs> But I, I would have to think somewhere in there he was a little weird. You know what I mean? Maybe the maybe the ladies said, "Oh, he's a little strange," but he's mostly a nice guy. So I would think to make it more interesting, you'd have to plant some seeds, like we call it foreshadowing. In, in a screenplay, you foreshadow something's going to happen. Uh, you know, they usually do it with a close up, like there'll be a scene, and uh, then they do a close up of a of a, a big beer mug. And it's like, that doesn't make sense. But later on, someone gets hit in the head with a big beer mug or, or it's broken on the floor. It's like, oh, I remember that mug. That was in that scene. So I would think they would foreshadow either one or the other uh, if you're going to play that kind of a, a psycho or, or a split personality, I guess so. Um, but I always look at whatever character you're playing, just, you know, that's the one you want to believe in and that's the one you're, you're trying to get across. Um, yeah, now just I'm just following like like McGuffin. Who's uh, I'm not even too sure of that one to be honest with you. You 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 aware of that one there? Which? What he said. Um, now, McGuffin. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not I'm not too sure of that character or, or that script. Uh, yeah, McGuffin. I I I know the term. I, I I just can't place it. Maybe that's what it is. A McGuffin, someone who appears to be somebody and there's something someone else yeah. i'm not sure we were asking the question but like yeah. to hear <laughs> refresh our memories yeah, guys, yeah I, again i just want to encourage you guys out there to to you know interact with us you know that's that's how we're gonna um have that back and forth conversation and you guys learn and and, and know exactly what you know you you we're talking about and um you know get exactly the information that you want out of this webinar you know we have uh, bob here so let's Let's pick his brain as much as possible, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, no, look, it's the foreshadowing of the object ahead of time. Oh, right, right. That's exactly what it is. The object ahead of time. I think you're right. That's what it is. It's not a character. It's it's, it's like the gun that you see in the beginning or the, whatever the, the, the murder weapon was. And it's like, 
you know, everybody's trying to figure it out what it was. And it's like, you know, I remember something that's like a hammer, but it's not a hammer or something, you know? I, yeah. I'm very familiar with the technique because actually I'm, that's something I mentioned in terms of when I do the workshop. And um, I, I mentioned about, you know, not every scene is not, it's not, it cannot be accidental. And so if, you, if you're going to show, if you go in and show, as, as you just said, the gun, you know, how it has to relate to the scene at some point in time. Um, but I'm actually I'm learning something today. I didn't realize it, it actually had a, a term. Um, so, yeah, so we all learn you know, something new. But yes, it, it's definitely something that that has been in in the movies forever. And again, another um, thing I say to to the, the students in the workshop is that film is all psychological, and and you know that's that's where again you play on the psyche of your audience by placing objects, placing things putting a scene in or a short sequence in that, that might come to play later on. And as you said, then the audience would be like, ah, oh, okay, that's why we saw this guy in the corner or that's why we saw that hammer on, on the floor. You know, that type of thing. Right. So, you know, it's not accidental, but you actually put those things there to get your audience going. And right, right. Like, like someone, cool. someone is getting, someone's getting dressed in the morning and they, they open up a dresser drawer to get a brush and you see a gun or a gun handle in there. That's all you see. And they put it in and they comb their hair and, and a half an hour later, the guy's in his room and someone's going to come in and try to get him. And it's like, you know, he's, he's dead. What can he do? And then he reaches in and gets the gun. And it's like, Oh yeah, I remember that gun. So it makes sense. It's not like if, if the gun ha hadn't been foreshadowed, it would be, wait a minute, there's a gun there, you know, yeah, but if yeah, it's been exactly. foreshadowed, but you forgot about it, but now you remember it. That's how you get them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, when I'm writing screenplays, I can't tell you how many times, you know, on page 50, I get an idea. But you have to go back to the beginning. It has to be foreshadowed. Where can this be poured in? You know what I mean? You can never write a screenplay in one draft, one way through. You just can't. There's too many things that need to need to add up, and that happens all the time in, in the writing aspect of it. You, you know, yeah. If you want to do something later, you just can't throw it out of left field. It has to be, has to be foreshadowed. But then you don't want some people to foreshadow it so much that you know, uh oh, we're going to be seeing that later, and that's yeah. kind of <laughs> then it gets yeah, like it has to be subtle in a way, you know. You can't, can't be predictable, right? You can't be too predictable. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. So, yeah, you were reading that that uh, just the last comment from. Um, yeah. No. No. Sorry. Mistaken. It's the. Check yeah, us on the main. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to get to the bottom of this MacGuffin thing. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> a whole new conversation. Or a whole, a different, I think I'm I'll think i do some research. Idea, I'll do some research. Colin will put it on his website. Uh, another thing I, I, I should have mentioned, guys, we would like to know also where you guys are from. Um, if you give us a quick, you know, indication, you know, once we have the conversation, you could, I know most of all, I, I know some of you guys are from the workshop, but if anybody outside of St. Lucia, it would be nice to know that, you know, you're tuning in outside of um, um, our island. Yeah, Bob, so let's just go back in terms of just your your stint in Hollywood. Um, just just give us a, 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 a brief as to what one of the things that you did that was really dear to you in terms of memorable, and a, another thing that you you know, you really did, you know, you wish didn't happen. So in other words, give us two examples, something really fantastic that happened to, to you in, in your process um, in, in getting to that top and, and you know, an example of, of something, you know, you said that, you know, you learned well, a very good lesson by not allowing this to ever happen again. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, I guess you could say there's things that happened on the set that are memorable. And then there are things, cause you know, that you're only shooting for a minuscule time you're on the set, you know, 10, 15, 20 seconds, then you cut and you, there's a lot of other stuff going on. But I was a young actor when I was doing Airwolf and I was able to go out. We were shooting on Catalina Island, which is right off the California coast. And so I was actually shuttled out there in the Airwolf helicopter with Ernest Borgnine and and Michael Vincent, and the pilot of Airwolf, you remember the helicopter was the whole show, yeah. Yeah. and he was a stunt 
guy as well. And oh my Lord, when we were going out there, he had this helicopter going upside down, pretty much about 100 feet above the water, the ocean. And he's laughing. And Ernie's going, oh, Jesus, do we have to do this again? Because <laughs> they, you know, ride with them all the time. I was so scared. But yet, you know, I couldn't say, I couldn't, you know, what am I going to say? Hey, do you know how to drive this thing? But it was, that was a memorable moment because I said, you know, this is crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to get there to shoot the movie. <laughs> so there were a few things like that, uh, those kind of situations. Um, and, there, and there were, you know, you know, I mean, I did a scene you got, you guys probably don't remember, but working with people like Michelle Phillips from the Mamas and Papas and in Fantasy Island, uh, she was a big celebrity, a big star, the Mamas and the Papas, and they were real big back then. And, and my scene was, I came out of this pool, it was, you know, Fantasy Island, so it was like a fantasy, and I had a kisser. And I go, here I am kissing this, one of the most beautiful women at the time. She was going out with Jack Nicholson or something, you know, and I'm kissing his girlfriend. <laughs> But and then you talk about scenes like I wanted to get one of my projects to Jack Nicholson. And again, it was the same hobo project I was talking about. Hobos are, are guys that ride and girls, but not many that ride freight trains around America. And they did it. They actually helped build the railroads back in the 1800s and all the way through the Depression. A lot of people were riding the rails. So I was kind of fascinated with the concept of it because it was like a modern day cowboy Americana thing. And I wanted to get it to Jack Nicholson. Now I used to play a, a lot of pickup basketball, you know, just for exercise. I played in high school and college a little bit, but later on I did it uh, at the Hollywood YMCA because you meet a lot of people. I played uh, against Marvin Gaye used to come down there uh, and he'd wear that red knit hat and he wasn't the greatest basketball player, but he was there to have some exercise. So you'd get to know these people on a personal level. So one time I decided, because Jack Nicholson was a big fan of the Los Angeles Lakers basketball team. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, exactly. So I got dressed up in my basketball outfit, you know, in those days, the high socks and just a pair of gym shorts and a you know tank top type of thing. And I was going by his place. I got his address up in Mulholland. And I drove by and I kind of parked across the street. It was a gated gated house with a lawn drive where you couldn't see the house. And sure enough, the gardener truck came by and pulled out. The gate was open and I drove my Mustang right in. This is, see this, you gotta have this kind of mentality, this kind of, this, 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 this unsatiable, insatiable desire to be in the business to do stuff like this. So I literally went in drove in, drove up, went up and knocked on his door. And I had a three quarter inch videotape of a documentary I had done on hobos for uh, public television, PBS, and my script in my whole package, like I mentioned earlier, the budget, the breakdown, his role. And he answered the door and he looked around. And he said, how did you get in here? And I said, well, uh, I it was just driving by and I had this project and the the gardener was leaving. What? You have a project? Don't you know I have an agent? I said, yeah, but they're not very receptive. They're unknown people like me. And he looked, they were kept looking around like, but it wasn't, it wasn't as tense. The times weren't as tense like they are now. I mean, now I'd probably be shot just going in there just by some security guard. And he ended up being very nice. He invited me in the house and he said, have a seat. Tell me more about this. And then I told him about it. He goes, yeah, we'll leave all that stuff and, you know, we'll get back to you. And I, I, the agent did get back to me. Uh, he had other projects lined up and, and couldn't do it. Um, so it didn't go anywhere after that. But I did run into him a few years later at, where I went to school at Lee Strasberg Theater Institute in Hollywood. And I would go in there because they always had interesting guests speak there. And he was speaking one night with Roman Polanski. And this is before Polanski's problems. And uh, and at the end of the, because there's probably only like 50 people in the audience. And at the end of it, I walked up to him and he said, hey, how you doing, man? How's the basketball going? And, uh, I said, I got another project. He goes, oh, okay, we'll call my agent and whatever. But so that was, you know, those kind of things were really um, memorable for me. Um, so 
So, you know, there's, I could tell you like a lot of stories like that. I mean, uh, from those kind of days, but uh, well, the one I, one of my favorite stories is from your editor, Joe, last week that in the editing room, you know, you get this movie, you shot everything, you think you have it, and then you need that in between scene or whatever. And so Joe says to me, he goes, you know, I think I have enough footage here on outtakes to make another scene. You know, it was going through some like a swinging door and there were people there and we needed to cut away. And he put together like five shots that I can't even imagine where he came from. Everything matched perfectly. And we had like a two minute scene um, out of left field. And so that's the kind of stuff that I get excited about because that's so creative, the creative things that happen in the editing room uh, that that are magical. And and those are the experiences that I remember the most. The, you know, the actors and the temper tantrums and that, you know, uh, th that's a different situation. But I, I remember and cherish those moments more than anything. And same thing on, on the set with people that you haven't worked with before. Uh, they turn out to be really, really intelligent and creative people. And, and, and they, and they want to really you know, make the best possible picture we can. That's why, you, that's why people hire the same people over and over again. Because it, it's such a grind when you're doing it. Every movie I've ever done, someone has walked off the set. Every movie. Uh, the makeup girl, she says one day, she was wonderful in interviews. Her portfolio was great. She was well recommended. We're on the set. We were shooting at a bowling alley midnight to 8 or 9 in the morning because they weren't bowling, so we could use the whole place. So the first night, we, have a catered, we had catered food. We had shrimp, I think, and beef stroganoff, and, you know, it was good food. And she says, comes over to me, and she's pouting. And she, no, so the, as a matter of fact, the first night she did pouted, and the second night she pouted, she finally said, what's wrong? She goes, nobody asked me if I was a vegetarian. And I said, oh, so she goes, there's never anything for me to eat. And I said, okay, well, I'm glad you told me, so now we can take care of that problem. But she was... She was for a couple of days. I mean, I, I could tell something was wrong with her, but, you know, if they don't say something, how do you know? So uh, she didn't walk off, but she was very strange about that whole thing, you know. So it just depends. You're working with personalities. It's to be expected. You can't let it disrupt the rest of the crowd, the crew, like the actors. Um, yeah, so, I mean, if you have any specific things, then I could probably get into them. But overall... Uh, the creative process is what gets my juice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to speak to you a little bit about that creative process, but I just realized um, Rene just dropped in here and he says, Joe is the man. Um, <laughs> Rene is <your> here. <laughs> and Joe is, is answering also. Um, but I just wanted to tell you guys out there that um, he, Rene will be joining us next week. Uh, and he's a cinematographer. And we'll be speaking with him on, on cinematography. And um, that's all part of, of Bob's team. Um, we heard from Joe last week, uh, who spoke on editing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously you have a, that nice team there together. But we know that there's always difficulty in, in just raising funds and stuff like that. So going into a set, what, how do you usually manage you know, um, just getting by. What is what is that like for you? You know, when I say getting by in terms of the budgets, and obviously sometimes I'm I'm sure that you know it, it doesn't. There's usually a, a overrun of time or, or 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 not not enough funds to complete. But give us a, a an idea of how you get over those those challenges. Okay, let me just first say one thing about Renee because. Um, this it goes back to the the wonderful things that your team does for you that you don't even know they're doing. Uh, Renee would always I would say okay you know sound, and then I'd say action. But he had the camera going. He always starts the camera up like ten seconds before I say action, and always lets it roll about ten seconds after I say cut. And I cannot tell you how many times actors, when he, when I, like I say, cut, and they go, and then they, you know, make some kind of gesture that they think they're not on camera, but it's a, it's a wonderful gesture that's so real because maybe they're 
you know, they're kind of stressed out about the scene. So they just go something like that, you know? And then that's the moment you want. And I can't tell you how wonderful that is and how many times we've used that. Uh, and that's just him more than me, totally more than me, being a cinematographer and knowing the heads and tails, we call them, of each take, how important they can be. And again, I would almost, it would be uncomfortable working with somebody else who you have to, now that I know these things, you have to tell everybody what to do, but you know, your team knows what to do. So, so that's a good point. Um, as far as raising money from a, a film, um, and you were saying, what's, how does that work? Yeah, no, not really raising it, but you might, you might be right into it because what we have is a lot of filmmakers, young filmmakers here listening to us. And uh, right. I keep on saying, you know, you don't have to have a million dollars to actually get things done. So, you know, what, what are the little shortcuts that you do in order to, you know, to try to just make things work? Um, I, for example, I give them examples on, in terms of what we're currently trying to do with our project, which is a lot of product placement and stuff like that. Um, but even outside of that, you know, in terms of a, a small budget, speaking to people, how do you usually go through that process? You might need a, you might need a restaurant, you know, to, to do a scene and, and which you might not pay, be able to pay for the restaurant. So which are the kind of negotiation skills that you need and how would you approach somebody on that level in terms of even actors they might have to do five extra scenes that would that were not you know on the table before you know how do you you know get them to say hey it's worth it you know even though we do we can't give you a dollar more <laughs> you know well you you said you just said it all right there you have to be a good negotiator you have to be a psychiatrist you have to be a babysitter you have to find a way to make it work and everybody's different so you you, you treat every situation kind of differently. You get a beat on what works with certain people, um, and, and the, but there's no fast one way to it all. But like when, if, you're, if you're a student, you know, the first thing people do when they, when they start out is friends and family. You know, you, those are the first people you approach. Um, and so I think whatever project it is, if it's a short film, which um, would probably be since you wouldn't have enough money to, to make a real feature, you have to be conscious of doing something interesting that's not going to cost much look at TikTok. TikTok now they have these five 20 second whatever clips and you know they're hilarious and they're seen by many many people um and in those so you, you have to think about what you can do on a low budget that that could be you know dramatic or funny or visual you know movies are a visual media so you you know you really want to try to say which is i try to do in my scripts sometimes we get a little too wordy but you really want to show everything that you can uh you know visually instead of just having talking heads going back and forth there's nothing more boring than that but if you can show things visually it's generally more cheaper to shoot things visually because if you're talking having actors you have to do two or three takes or whatever to get the lines right or, or whatnot but if someone's kind of racing through a park you can pretty much set up here set up there and, and do a lot of setups and get and get a an idea of whatever the theme of your story is in a short time so i would say the first thing you do is you, you get enough money to shoot it from from your families and friends and then you just try to go a little bigger every time i mean your family and friends are going to run out of money and you're not going to really in a short film, you're not going to be able to produce any uh, profit from that. So the idea is to just kind of work your way up the ladder and to have people, when you hire them, you just don't know how it's going to turn out. But again, if you hire Renee and Joe, if I ever had to say, look at, I know we're working a little overtime, but we're losing the sun. We have to get these other shots. And they never, ever say, well, Bob, uh, it's quitting time. Uh, because they are team players, they know the importance of it. They know I'm not trying to get extra work out of them. We're all trying to make the best movie that we can. So, you know, you want to. It's like any business. You want to surround yourself with the best people you can, yeah. and you can't always do that. That that that's another thing about lower budget independent movies. You have that. And the bigger studio yeah. pictures that have done. They have people coming in from corporate. They have people this and that. They don't even know how to make a movie. They're all concerned about the budget. And someone else is concerned about their girlfriend getting in the picture. It's just so many other things that 
that have nothing to do with the movie or making the movie. So, um, yeah, you know, do something simple. If you're an actress or an actor, and you're having somebody shoot it, you know, try to try to make it a scene with impact. You don't want to just sit there patting your dog or something. You know, you want to either have a you know some kind of a dramatic scene and, and dramatic action. Uh, you know, if you're if you're an athlete, like a lot of these people segue from from athletics into movies to show some guy in a chase scene, but he's jumping over hurdling trees and limbs, he swims across a, a canal and he climbs up on a boat and then climbs up a rock. And I mean, people are going to say, wow, look at this guy. He's unbelievable. You know, he's, so, and, or if you're a singer, do, do a, or if you're an actress, you can sing, you know, put a little singing in there somewhere uh, or dancing, any of those type of things. You need to show your skills. You need to show what sets you apart. How many musicians, someone will say, you sound just like Bruno Mars. You sound just like him. Well, if you're a singer, you may be flattered by that, but it's, it's, it's probably not that good for you. I mean, look at Rod Stewart. When I heard that voice, I go, this guy is a singer. He can a scratchy voice and all that stuff, but he, he's so unique. You know what I mean? So there's nothing wrong with being unique. If someone says, you don't sound like anybody, I've never heard a voice like that before. That's a good thing. That's gold. Well, well, maybe you should you could take that into your your process of filmmaking too, because then you you know you just have your unique style, and that's what everybody's looking for. This is the next unique style that they could you know grab. That's right. Yeah. And as a director, I remember I don't know the name of the director, but I saw one movie years ago. Everything he shot was like low angle. Oh, I know what it was. It was the first one of the first dog, you know animal movies and the camera was down low the whole movie from a pov of a dog so it was wonderful remember that movie memento where they told it backwards i mean different styles and different ways to do it especially with the you're a cameraman you know more than i do as far as there's so many ways to shoot a scene you know you want your character who's who's the hero you shoot the low angle looking up okay you want the guy to look like a little weasel so you always show him inferior you know angle so these are basic things so you know uh when they when they first started doing the dollies i remember we used a wheelchair to get a dolly shot you know something like a camera and there was in a wheelchair and we pushed them along the, the sidewalk to get that tracking shot and um so yeah you want to but they should have a purpose you know you don't want to just throw them in there if there's no purpose to it um and i always tell younger filmmakers and try to uh, follow the philosophy to always have at least two things going on in the frame, you know, but you want to have some kind of something else going on in the frame. And some of the masters do it so well um, that uh, it's, it's something to be emulated because uh, these days, especially the more you can have going on without making it too busy, but people, their attention span has, has yeah. come a long way. You really have to keep, you know, like commercials now. I mean, commercials, a 30-second commercial probably has, I don't know, what, split-second shots. I mean, they must they must shoot for a week to get 30 seconds. I mean, there's so many quick shots. So it's a matter of style. Uh, the, the, your guys have been making some comments. I don't know how far you went back. But he was just, um, Joe was just saying that, you know, just um, kind of expanding on what you said in terms of, you know, working with people that you you like it's like icing on a cake which yeah, is so true which which again i've said that i've been doing this for 30 years and i've never woke up one day in my life and say oh i don't want to go to work i'm always ready and happy to go me to too <laughs> so you know i can't it's, wait it's, it's the joy of this industry you know it really is it's such a love and my sister like i mentioned she she said what are you wasting your time you could be making a lot of money and it's like uh her husband hated his job by the way but he made a lot of money and so I said, well, I don't want to be like your husband. You tell me how great he is. I don't want to be like him at all. I love what I'm doing. And, and my, my nephew, I have like a few nephews, and he came up to me maybe 10 years ago, and he was about 40 at the time. And he goes, you know, life's good, but I don't have a passion. I don't have a passion. He was selling insurance or something. And I said, I said how, do you, how do you find a passion? I said, whoa, uh, I just tried a lot of different things, and it just came out of left field. I mean, I was a good student in college. But when I was taking acting classes, you could sit in on other classes, you know, and I would be there all day. I would be there all day and night because I was, 
I wanted to learn this. So I don't know how you find that. I mean, I think everybody, every person on this planet could have a passion. There's a passion waiting inside them. I don't think you and I are unique, Colin. I think there are other people, people that are passionate about medicine. Yeah, people yeah. that are passionate about yeah. Teachers, you know, so, but if you don't try something, if you stay in the job or the whatever your, your your situation is, and you're not a happy person, you don't have any passion, you don't want to go to work, you don't want to get out of bed, then I would search for that before I looked how much money I'm going to make, or yeah. you know, because right. you'll probably be good at it anyways. If you like it so much, you're going to study extra, you're going to spend extra time, and these are the things that that make you good, that make you qualified, that make you make more money. So, you know, those are the things that are, it's pretty simple, but for some people it's, it's tough to grasp. And I'm just very lucky. You're very lucky that we, we don't have to look for our passion. Yeah. We found it. I totally I thought agree with it. Well, you know, Bob, and I think a lot of the people here that are on this today, uh, I know Joe and Renee are that, that same way. These guys are just, that's what they do. I mean, uh, you know, they drop everything to make a movie. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to say this conversation would go on forever and ever because we, you know, we could talk film forever. Uh, but I, I just in closing, I, 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 one last question I wanted to, to, in terms of getting your, your production out there, in terms of hitting the film festivals and so forth, what is that process that you usually take in order to, to get it out? I'm sure the, the game, the young filmmakers would want to get, get, get to know that. So maybe we could end on, on that note. Yeah, I think well, today I can. It's totally evolved over the years. Um, you know, it, I think it's easier to become a filmmaker today in a lot of ways because of the social media. For one thing, when I first started out as a writer, you had to print up, you know, a lot of scripts. You had to send them out everywhere. That costs money. Everything costs money. Now you just, you know, email everything. And the same thing is with the social media. And again, going back to TikTok and some of these kind of social media things, you can really get your your work out there to a lot of people. And, and that's the first step. Now, again, so many film festivals right now, and they just, to me, I don't think they have quite the impact that they used to have because there were prestigious Venice, Berlin, um, you know, San Francisco, Canada, New York. Canada, the big one, Which one? I'm just in Canada. Canada. The big one. Yeah, exactly. But that's still a big one. Um, so, you know, you can, in, in, the, in the entry fees, you know, they're not cheap if you're a young person and, and you want to enter your film in like 50 different festivals, but it does get you some recognition. I mean, up in Park City there, you know, all of the Sundance Festival was big for a while. It's still big, but um, uh, yeah, so I, I think you just have to, like anything, you have to get it out there. Make up a trailer if you have a longer, like we'll do with our movie, we'll, we'll make up a, you know, a nice two minute trailer, a 30 second trailer. And we'll just pound it out there in social media. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then you get your name out there, which is much more prevalent now than ever was when I was growing up. We had no, no, you either got picked up by a producer or a distributor and, or that was it. I mean, there were, was no alternative. American film market is, is a big deal for independent, lower budget pictures uh, to get distribution. Um, but yeah, I think the social media thing is the way to go for, for younger people and, it's cheap, it's easy, and it's just you know, just getting the link up there. And IMDb, IMDb, you know, the International Movie Database is, has become very popular, and people, you know, like with me, I don't, if, I, if people want to know anything about me, you cannot be on there. You can't fake your resume because you have to have direct, you, your name has to appear in the credits of the show you're saying you're on. I mean, when I was going through the system, everybody said they were in Gone with the Wind and every other movie in the world. And, you know, and, and no casting director was going to go through the credits. So I don't know if they believed half the people anyways. But now if you're on IMDb, you are pretty much verified. So, and again, that's the Internet. So here we go with the Internet. Everything's the Internet. And that's where our movies end up. So it makes sense. Thank you, Bob. Um, Thank you so much for, for, for coming on today. Yeah, and for coming on again, this yeah. is the second week we're doing this as part of our series of webinars, um, the Caribbean Film wow. Festival, our ninth year. Um, as wow. we put on workshops with the youth and, and give them various skills in filmmaking, we also put it on those webinars to speak to professionals like Bob and Joe we had last week, and, and Renny we're going to have next week. 
Um, so three students next week where we're going to teach uh, on cinematography. So we're going to get a little more about the, the techniques of filmmaking with, with Rene. Um, again, let me just thank our sponsors, who is the OECS, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, um, the Ministry of Creative Industries, the St. Lucia National Trust for hosting those webinars that we have, beautiful location. Um, I guess we might have to do a scene there, that's Bob, when you come when we shoot out, so definitely. <laughs> and, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And, and let me say one more thing to all the listeners, that Colin is the first person I've ever heard when I, when we were talking in, in, in about going to film school in London, in New York. I mean, this guy's got, got it down. He, this is a serious man. And he's the first director I've ever heard that didn't necessarily want to be the next Spielberg or George Lucas. He wanted to bring filmmakers to St. Lucia. I mean, this is an honorable man who sees filmmaking as a, a boon for the, I mean, you know, the, uh, uh, as, as, as the great thing for the whole country and the people of St. Lucia. And he's, he knows his stuff and uh, he's a very dedicated person. And I thank you, Colin, for having me on board here to do whatever I can, because I, I think it's good for everybody. It really is. It gives people a lot of pride in their country. And um, you're the man. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, basically what we said before is that the passion was always there. And as a young boy coming out of school, I mean, there were never opportunities. And I just think today the opportunity, opportunities are still very slim. You know, so, um, you know, rather than me complaining about it, I'm trying to do something about it. You know, something that's something human nature, you know, we complain and we don't really try to do. So, so I'm just trying to do that one thing and actually try to do something about it. At least those coming after me, it will not be as difficult for them as it was for me. Because really, and truly, I can tell you, there was absolutely no avenue um, for me coming out of school. But again, that passion, I knew that I had to, I, I that's what I wanted to do. And, so yeah, right. we have a beautiful place here called Satusha, and I think that the film industry could really do wonders for the island. And again, we have so many talented people on island. Um, we have seen right. The past, you know, I mean, we we, we talk uh, again. If we have to go back just to what we we have been accomplished, we we have a, a, a Nobel laureate in, in poetry. You know, um, you know, Derek Walker. Just, you know, so and and we we need to mimic that kind of um, status that we that we who stayed on, upon us. So, you know, we like to continue and know that we we have the talent and have the resources to get this you know, off the ground. They just need the opportunity. Yeah, and you're the guy that's going to get it to them. And then everybody's going to want to come down there. You're going to have people who have worked in movies. You're going to have people uh, who are knowledgeable about it. And it's just going to go yeah. from there. So someone has to start the ball rolling. Yeah, exactly. And you're the guy to do that. So, uh, you know, hats off to you. And, and like I mentioned before in a conversation we had, there's a Bob Marley on your island somewhere, or a Barbara Marley, but there's someone who, when you hear Bob Marley, does anybody think of Jamaica? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to so find him and put him in this yeah, movie. We get, it, we get it happening. But again, let exactly. me thank you, Bob, so much for, okay. for joining um, our ninth annual Caribbean Youth Film Festival. And again, just out there to everybody who tuned in, and this will be will be replayed and be available on our website, um, um, cuttv.net. So anybody who wants to see it, please send a link to your friends who, who missed it. And um, see you next week. And again, Bob, thank you so much for coming on board. And everybody, thank you for joining. You're very welcome, and thank you. Yeah. Have a good one. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.